Welcome back everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at some games that are being played in the Prague Challengers Tournament, which is being held in the Czech Republic. Now there's an event going on with the Prague Masters, which features players around the 2700 rating mark, and also the Prague Challengers, which is a lower group for players who are aspiring to get towards that critical 2700 mark. Now the player in question whose games I'm going to be covering is this player from Slovakia. His name is Jurgis Pechak. Now I apologize to anyone who is out there from Slovakia if I butchered his name but at any rate his games have caught my eye for a couple of reasons I would say that currently when you look at players who are above the 27 2600 rating mark I should say maybe that includes 2700 to be fair I would say 2600 and up this player is the most creative and most original player when it comes to opening gameplay so let's jump right into the action now the first game we're going to be taking a look at is a game that was played between Mateusz Bartel from from Poland and of course Jurgis Pechak now the game starts with the move e4 we get e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. Okay, all normal. And then we get this move a5. Now, when I first saw this move, I have to confess, I have never, ever seen this move in my life. So when I saw this game, I was like, wait a second. Did Petchak just make a mouse slip? Did he, did he like actually mouse slip over the board when he played a5? Because we've had nearly 500 years of theory in the classic Spanish or the Rui Lopez opening. And the main move that is played overwhelmingly is this move pawn to a6, attacking the bishop on b5. So what is this nonsense? What is this a5 move? You don't attack the bishop. Now the bishop is completely safe on this b5 square. What on earth is going on? Now, apparently, this is actually some sort of weird theory. It's been known for a while now. But I was not the only one who was caught off guard completely so this is where i'm going to show you guys there was this tweet that i saw on twitter from the famous israeli grandmaster famous trainer as well boris avruk where he put out this tweet which said excuse me in relation to seeing three a5 in the game so this a5 move is very very strange as i said it's not a move that i ever seen prior to seeing this game but now of course i'm going to study it and i will probably look to play it Additionally, there's another critical point that I have to make, which is the paradigm shifts in chess with the rise of computers have changed a lot over the years. In the old days, I would say that if I were to show Gary Kasparov a move like A5, let's say I see Gary in New York, we're, we're having a we're having some tea or something like that, and I say someone played A5, Gary would give me this very like dirty look. He'd be like, he'd be like, what are you talking about? Is there something wrong with you? Are you are you like mentally ill? Do you not wait, do you not know how to play chess or what are you even talking about? But because of how good computers have become almost any move is playable as long as it doesn't outright hang material so anyway the game continues after a5 we get castles knight to d4 played by petrak and already we start to see the reason reasoning behind playing a5 which is black wants to take some space on the queen side so let's say white white were to trade for example and play a move like d3 already you lose the game instantly after c6 because when you go bishop c4 there's b5 bishop b3 a4 uh oh spaghetti -o. your bishop is completely trapped you have no squares available on the diagonal and you just lose the game GG, why not? So already we start to see the reasoning behind a5, which is that you don't care about the bishop on b5. You just want to take space on the queen side, start pushing p, and improve your position. So after knight d4, we get bishop c4, knight takes f3, queen takes f3. Now, Mar Matus Bartel, of course, trying to go for the classic four move checkmate in return for the disrespect that is shown by his opponent by playing this a5 move. We get knight to f6, now d4 is played, and we have d6. If black were to take the pawn on d4, you pretty much, maybe you don't lose on this box after e5, there's d5 here, but it's pretty scary after takes, takes, a move like bishop to g5, or even a move like rook to e1 potentially, and white should have a big advantage. So of course here we get the move d6 to guard the pawn at e5 game continues with knight c3 e takes d4 and now we have knight to b5 here attacking both the pawns on c7 and d4 bishop to e6 is played by petchak the bishops are traded we get knight takes d4 e5 knight to e6 and now after queen to d7 queen b3 white has a little bit of an advantage here. again not overwhelming by any stretch of the imagination but white should be better because black is struggling to castle his king out of the center of the board game continues with c6 we get f4 here knight takes e4 f takes e5 and now a4 is played again when you push the pawn to a5 you might as well come up with a concept for why you've done that and so now the pawn being on a5 is very good because after a4 the queen can only go to h3 to guard the knight if you go to c4 i have d5 guarding my own knight attacking your queen and when you move your queen to say e2 i just take the knight and win the game on the spot so we get queen to h3 knight to c5 played here and now but now Mateus bartel plays queen to h5 
and after g6 knight takes c5 g takes h5 the position has pretty much stabilized here after knight d7 king d7 and black is already completely fine here and also having this pawn in a4 is very useful in the end games because again you can push these pawns and this a pawn is closer to the end of the board and it's actually going to matter as we'll see so the game continues with rook f7 we get king to e6 rook to f6 check is played here and now after rook to f6 we get the move king takes e5 bishop to g5 and now king to d5 now again having pushed the pawn up the board is very useful because the idea that Petchak has in mind here is to potentially run the king to b5 play d5 build a chain and or push these pawns down the board so we get rook f5 king e6 rook f6 king d5 and now Bartel decides to play rook to d1 check because he does not want to make a draw so after rook d1 we have king c4 and now the king is really wandering up the board but the king is also completely safe because the king is just going to go to b5 and after d5 white can't really attack the king easily so we get rook f7 creating the classic kebab on the seventh rank rook to g8 and now after bishop to f6 we have this move b6 being played after b6 we get rook takes h7 and now d5 is played here by Petchak. after rook takes h5 we have bishop to c5 check bringing the last in undeveloped piece into the game so now we get king to h1 rook a to e8 b3 and king to b5 and while white is currently up upon here you'll see one two three four five versus one two three four black has a lot of activity on the queen side this a pawn is dangerously close to the end of the board which is why Petrak played a5 instead of a6 because he knew that we were going to reach an end game where this pawn would be the critical reason or the critical uh count would be the reason he would have all the counterplay in the position so after king to b5 we get c4 being played here by Bartel pawn takes pawn takes king king to b4 another move which I don't know if it's absolutely best but the idea is straightforward what, what Petchak wants to do is go king a3 grab the pawn and start pushing this a pawn down the board that's the only plan he has in mind so now we get rook to b1 king to a3 played here and now Bartel goes rook to h3 check attacking the king on a3 here king takes a2 would actually lose on the spot because there's rook to a1 which is simply checkmate here king has no squares but black can go rook to e3 and with this very active king on a3 this pass pawn on a4 black has more than enough counterplay in order to avoid losing the game even though white has two connected pawns on the king side so the rooks come off we get rook to e1 and now we have bishop to g5 trade and now after rook to e2 we get b5 now here black is a king on a3 and he's pushing these pawns down the board very quickly white very fortunately has these two connected pawns which means that he has just enough play not to lose the game we get pawn takes pawn pawn takes pawn g3 b4 king g2 not h4 of course then you would hang the pawn on g3 king g2 b3 takes takes and now after h4 we get this move rook to c5 very critical move by the way because maybe all moves lead to Rome but if you were to play a move like rook to f5 for example now white gets a tempo attacking the rook and suddenly with these pawns pushing up the board I guess it's still probably a draw with b2 but it could be very scary whereas when you go rook to c5 here white cannot push the h pawn because you capture it if white goes g4 after rook to rook to c2 black wins the game and when white goes king h3 b2 now white has had to waste the move bringing the king forward and now the pawns are never going to be quick enough getting to the end of the board here so after b2 we get the sack king g4 king c3 h5 king to d4 and now we get h6 king e4 h7 rook c8 king g5 and now petchak decides to go king f3 and the game ends peacefully after king f6 king g3 king to g7 king to g4 h8 queen takes takes and it's a draw so what have we learned from this first game that we've looked at first thing we've learned from this game is that you can evidently play anything in the world and it's fine so a5 is a little bit unusual but not too far off the beaten path so now let's move to the seventh whoops sorry let's move to the seventh round and I already messed that up a little bit maybe I'll edit it out we'll see um but we move to the seventh round now this is the, this is the game between Jurgis Petchak with the white pieces and Benjamin Gladura so we saw a5 a little bit unusual but now in round number seven Petchak decides to play one h4 he decides to go even further off the beaten track and decides to get 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 wild with it by going h4 now I do not know if this move if this move has a name I think actually it does it's called the Kadas opening it is not considered playable let alone let alone playable by somebody who is very respectably over 2600 that being said if you want to see someone even higher rate to play h4 definitely make sure to check out the disrespect speed run which was done by Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura check it out on our YouTube channel at any rate I don't know maybe the inspiration for Petchak was he saw my speedrun he thought okay I can do anything and I could be be like Hikaru or bro thinks he's Hikaru as the meme goes but at any rate he plays h4 so we get h4 here and all and I saw this and I was like you've got to be kidding me what is up with this guy what what does he think he's doing 
So we get h4, Gladura plays d5, and now Petrak plays d4. Of course, in my speed runs, I generally play g3, but after e5, black is simply getting too much of the center. So when we get d4, what's happened here is that white is base played d4, d5, h4. Now, again, I will keep this in mind for the next time that I feel like memeing in a regular tournament because it's very it's very common in games of chess that you'll get d4, d5. So if I do determine that h4 is playable, then I might just create a new line with d4, d5, h4 and develop some new theory myself. But at any rate, the show goes on so here what happens is we get knight to f6 e3 is played here by petschak and now we get c5 played by gudura now already this feels a little bit wrong because to me when you've gone h4 it feels like you have to try to go bishop f4 and sort of mix some kind of like london system in here whereas after e3 c5 with the lack of development here feels like this pawn is just completely misplaced on h4 so surely petschak is going to lose the game so we get c4 being played here e6 and now we have the move knight to f3 d takes c4 is played and now we get bishop takes c4 and a6 and now again we've also done another sort of slight transmission where this is effectively turned into a queen's gambit accepted but again white has a pawn on h4 so the normal way you get a queen's gambit accepted is something like d4 d5 c4 takes knight f3 knight f6 e3 e6 takes let's just say c5 and then move like knight c3 and a6 for example so when we get to this position, the main difference is white has played h4 here versus, say, a knight c3 or castles, but nonetheless, it is effectively a queen's gambit accepted. So now Petschak goes h5, starts pushing Harry the h pawn up the board. Gladura plays h6, fixing the weakness on h5 here and making it very difficult for white to castle. So now we get bishop to e2, knight b to d7, and now Petschak plays knight b d2, and Gladura goes b6 here, trying to fianchito the bishop to b7. And already here, I think it's safe to say that this opening has not worked out for white, because you have this permanent weakness on h5. It's very difficult to castle here and just hang the pawn. You don't really have any play in the center. There's no grip. And so for that reason alone, having this pawn at h5 means it should be worse for white. So we get b3 here, bishop b7, bishop b2, and now we have bishop to e7 being played like by Gladura. And now we get d takes c5 and knight takes c5. Now here I think the bishop takes c5 would have been a better move. I suspect that the reason Gladura did not play this move is probably a little bit concerned about a move like knight c4 with the idea of knight to d6. But after castles here, if white plays move like knight e5, black can actually just grab the pawn as scary as it looks because after rook to g1, if you were to play a move like bishop d5, knight takes d7 is game over. If you take with the queen, uh-oh, spaghettio, there's a pin on the pawn on g7 and you lose right away. If you take back with the knight, Rook takes g7 check king h8 and now white does what we call the classic windmill strategy which is check check and take the knight check check and well i guess you actually should just take the queen here to win the game but it's a bit of a windmill so so it does look very scary for black to say go into a line like this but in a position like this black actually has a nice move bishop b4 check and now the king has no squares you have to play knight to d2 here and now after knight takes e5 bishop takes e5 and bishop b7 Queen guards the knight on f6, and black is simply much better. I don't know if black is actually winning here, but black has great chances due to being up this extra pawn, which he captured on g2. Instead, we get knight takes c5, and now we have knight to c4. Gladura plays knight e4, and now Petschak's able to trade the queens here. And once the queens come off the board, this, this weak, weak pawn on h5 is no longer that big of a deal. And already here, white has very limited issues. So we get bishop takes d8. Petschak plays bishop d4, we get b5, and now he goes knight to b6. We get bishop takes b6, takes, and now knight to d5, and bishop to d4, and cast, or not bishop b4, sorry, bishop to a5, and castles. Now it's worth pointing out that the reason that this position is completely fine for white, aside from the fact that it's an endgame and queens are off the board, is that this h5 pawn, if anything, is actually a big strength. Because in this, in this pawn structure, one of the things that black would love to do is play something like f6 and e5 and build a chain in the center. Now, if this pawn were on h7, black would be completely fine here. But with this structure here, white can always go knight to h4 and try to put a knight on either the f5 or the g6 squares. Whereas if I just go and set up a random position, let me just go back to this queen's gambit accepted just to illustrate the point. Um, if you go back to some queen's gambit accepted, just, just bear with me for a second, you guys. Um, just, just to show you guys some, some example of how this would go. Uh, something like b3 takes, 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 92, king e7. There, there are plenty of situations where you've got some position, not this exact position, of course, because this is better for white, but you'll get some position like this, where if black can get e5 and get this chain of pawns with the idea like bishop e6, black should be completely fine, if not a little bit better, down the road. 
But in this position with, with the inclusion of the pawns being on h5 and h6 like in the game here, this idea, it just doesn't exist anymore because, because this pawn on h5 is a big strength as opposed to a weakness since it creates those squares for the knight to jump to. So for that reason, white is completely fine. So after bishop a5, we get castles. And now here, Petchak decides to play rook to h4, activating the rook. Computer actually prefers to move like knight d2, trying to trade off the knights and prove the value of the two b's here on a5 and e2. But nonetheless, rook to h4 is a very inspired move, which I personally like quite a lot. We get knight d to f6. Knight to d4 is played here. And now what Petchak is trying to actually do is exactly what I said Black can do with f6 and e5, where White wants to play something like f3 and e4, build a big white center with a chain of three pawns. And Black really has no squares here. Now, if, if we could imagine you could put the pawns on h3 and h4, for example, then the knight could go to f4, g3. But the pawn on h5 and h6 actually means that this structure is very, very good for White. So again, Petchak showing that he knows what's going to happen down the road in the game. And for that reason, that's why he played h4 and h5. He knew it would be super, super critical. So after knight to d4, we get rook a c8. Petchak plays f3. And now we get knight to c3 and bishop to d3. Knight c to d5, attacking the pawn on e3. Here, Petchak plays king to d2, guarding the pawn on e3, preparing to play e4 and or maybe rook c1. Knight e7 played here by Gladura, and we get pawn to a4. Now, a4 is maybe not a bad move, but it's not the best move. What Petchak should have done here is simply traded off the rooks and tried to play this in a very slow manner. Now, again, based on the opening of the position Petchak has gotten here, it's very hard to change because at this point, he's thinking, wow, I played one h4. I've got a pretty good position. I have two bishops in an endgame. Like, I'm on the way to winning. I lift my rook to h4. All these very inspired creative juices are flowing. And so to sort of dial it back and then suddenly start playing it like a very dry dry middle game and try to squeeze it like a Magnus Carlsen would it's very hard to do that and so that's why I think he played a4 instead of playing it playing a little bit more slowly with something like rook c1 but after a4 pawn takes rook takes black now can go knight to d7 with ideas like knight c5 and knight to e5 here and already white can't really claim that much of an advantage because there only is one set of pawns on the queen side generally in the queen's game would accept it if you can keep two sets of pawns on the board and keep improving the position you try to avoid trading pawns on the queen side immediately you try to take it a little bit slower but after a4 takes takes knight d7 we got bishop to b4 rook f8 played by by Gladura, and now we get bishop to a6, which is of course fine, but with only one pawn each on the queen side, it peters out very, very quickly. So we get bishop takes a6, takes, takes, knight to d5, attacking the bishop on b4. We get bishop to d6, and now Gladura plays knight to c5 here, attacking potentially the pawn on b3 as well as the rook on a6. We get bishop takes knight, rook takes, and even though white is up one extra pawn on b3, black is completely fine for two reasons. First of all, e3 is a little bit weak, there's an open c file which black can stack on and black also has e5 to kick the knight away from the d4 square which does cover that critical c2 square so black really has very limited issues so here petrak plays e4 gladura goes knight e7 and now we get rook to d6 trying to stop black from going rook d8 and pinning the knight on d4 and now we get rook to b8 Petchak plays rook d7. We get king to f8 here. And already the position is effectively a draw because of the simple fact that say you play a move like rook h1, there's always e5 here to remove the knight from the d4 square, and black will eventually win the pawn on b3. So we get f4 here trying to stop e5. King to e8 played, played by Gladura. We get rook to d6, rook to b4. And now after king to d3, we get rook c1, and the game ends peacefully with a repetition here, and the game is drawn. Now, it's worth noting here, white can't really play on because if white tries to play on the same move like e5, for example, black has rook takes d4, and after rook takes d4, there's knight to f5, forking d's rooks, and if you move the rook to h3, I go rook to d1 check, capture the rook, and I simply have an extra horse. Actually, I guess king c3, it's more precise to take with a knight because if you were to take with a rook, white still has g4 potentially, and there are some drawing chances. So the game ends in a draw. So what, what, do, what do we have? So this, this game ends in a draw here, um, and... And with that, Petchak has done very well. He drew with this very unorthodox a5 in the Spanish, and he drew with one h4. It doesn't get any better than that, right? He's used up his two big secrets in the tournament, and it's been very creative, very exciting to watch, and that's it, right? So let's go to today's game in round number eight, where Petchak has the white pieces against Alexander Motilov, a very strong Russian grandmaster. I believe he recently defected due to the ongoing situation. Um, but nonetheless, very strong Russian player, strong trainers worked with a lot of the top players. I think he worked with Sergei Karyak and maybe Jan Nepomnichi as well. And he's playing, playing chess. So Petchak with the white pieces, round number eight today. What else can he do? He plays the move one knight to h3. Now, again, I was on Twitter this morning and I, th this also caught my eye because we had a tweet 
Um, well, I guess I'll get to the right position. We have knight h3, e5, g3, knight f6, and now Petrak plays d4. And here's where we have another tweet. Now, this tweet is from the man himself. I guess I'll make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. This is from the man himself. This is from um, Jan Pomnashi. This was this was a tweet this morning, which says, "Is is it the future of chess we deserve?" Um, and and so Jan Nepomuchi getting in on the action here, having some fun here, talking about it as well. He's saying like, "Is this the future of chess that we deserve?" And I don't know whether that answer is yes or no, but it is an interesting point that Jan raises. At any rate, let's get back to the get back to the game. So. We've had knight h3, e5, g3, knight f6, and d4 being played. And already what Petchak is trying to do here is trying to argue that, yes, I put the knight on the rim, but the knight will jump back to the center very, very quickly. Because if you play e4, knight can always go to f4 immediately. If you take, again, you free the square for the horse, and the knight will jump in towards the center of the board and create problems for the black pieces. So after d4, Modilev decides to take. Now, one thing that I did not check, actually, because I wasn't watching as literally live as the game began, is how much time was used by Modilev. But I'm sure even for Modilev, after knight to h3, he must have been thinking, like, what the heck is going on? Like, this guy's played this h4, and he's playing knight h3. Like, what, what is this? It's some kind of weird chess that I don't know. So we get e takes d4, queen takes d4. Now Modilev correctly plays knight c6. You figure if your opponent is going to take liberties in the opening, like putting the knight on the rim, bringing the queen out, playing like a total potzer, as we like to say in chess, you got to punish him. On the flip side, however, there is one big danger from a psychological standpoint in chess at the higher levels when this happens, which is if your opponent plays bad opening, and you feel like you need to punish him and you're not able to punish him, it starts to become very, very demoralizing on the one hand because you know your opponent is playing nonsense. They're playing stupid moves. It's not proper chess, whatever you want to call it. And so if they're able to equalize, you start to become demoralized and you start getting angry at yourself because you know you've done something wrong inherently from the start of the game. So from a psychological standpoint, there is a lot of merit to playing like this, whether it's playing random random openings like this, whether it's playing slightly dubious variations, which Magnus has done on many occasions, but there are definitely merits from a psychological standpoint. So after knight c6, we get queen to a4, and now Modilev goes all in here. It's punishment time. My opponent is not following the Russian school of chess. He's playing like somebody who's just learned chess two days ago, and we get the move b5 here, which is going all in. So we get queen takes b5, Modilev plays rook to b8, and now we get queen to g5, swinging the queen all over the board. Now for anyone who's looking at this video, you're thinking, this guy, Jurgis Petschak, he is rated 2611. He is obviously a very, very strong chess player, but what is he doing? He played knight h3. First of all, moving knight on move one. No, 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 not right. Second, knight on the rim. No, 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 no. Third, he's moved his queen one, two, three, four times in the first seven moves of the game. No, 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 no. You do not do this. This is not acceptable. So for all the kids who are watching this video at, video at home, um, this is one of those situations like when you see the ad on TV where it says, you know, professional driver, do not attempt to stunt, do not attempt this at home or do not attempt to stunt, whatever the exact legalese is. Um, but that's exactly what I'm going to add as a disclaimer to this video. You see Petchak playing this, but do not try this at home. So we get queen to g5, knight to b4 being played by Modilev, and now we get knight to a3. Petchak, true to form, puts his other knight on the rim here to guard the pawn on c2. So after knight to a3, we got bishop to b7. Petchak goes f3. And now Modilev plays h6. Now, the one good thing about this position for Petchak is, first of all, one of the central pawns, the e-pawn, has been traded for the d-pawn. And so with black unable to really get a lot of grip with pawns in the center of the board, per se, even though white has wasted a lot of time, white is actually doing completely fine here. So after h6, we get queen to e3 check. Another move that looks like a total pots move. I personally would have probably just gone queen d2, bishop g2, and castles. But Petchak, I think, actually has studied this. And so he plays queen to e3. Because the, the one drawback to queen d2 is that black can go bishop c5, trying to take advantages of the weaknesses on both of these diagonals. So we get queen e3. Bishop to e7 played by Modilev. And now Petchak plays the move bishop to g2. After bishop g2, we get knight b to d5, and now Petchak plays queen f2. Now, at this point, it's great to see that the computer says that white should go all in here. It, again, Petchak is playing this game like a lunatic, completely wild, out of his mind, and the computer says, you know what? Just grab that pawn on a7. Just grab it, as we say in the game only up, which I've been playing a lot of lately. So he should have just grabbed the pawn on a7. Computer says after castles, castles. It looks kind of scary because the queen is like really out of play here on a7. And after a move like knight b6, you're worried maybe the queen's going to get trapped or something bad's going to happen. But the computer says, no fear. It's like, see no evil, hear no evil, fear no evil. Just play knight to f4, and your queen's not actually getting trapped. And white has a very, very small advantage um, considering there's up two pawns. That being said, 0.12, considering that white has two extra pawns, is also not a good sign. because That means that it's not that much of an advantage. 
So pet check goes queen f2. We got bishop to b4 check, and now he goes c3. And here Modi Love decides to play knight takes pawn on c3. Pet check castles. He does not capture the knight here, except for pawn takes knight, bishop takes pawn, it's check, and you simply lose your rook in the corner pocket and you're down material. Additionally, if you try to go queen to e3, checking the king and attacking the knight at the same time, black can simply go knight c to e4, and after king to f1, it looks like you're going to win the knight due to the pin here, because you can't move the knight away, but black can simply go bishop to c5, and after, say, queen f4, black can probably just trade and go knight d6, and black is okay. Although, again, there, maybe there is some merit to this. The computer doesn't think it's that bad for white either, or maybe white's even slightly better, oddly enough. But it doesn't happen. At any rate, pet check castles. We get queen to e7 here, attacking the pawn on e2. But also, if white if white tries to um, capture the knight on c3, now you can go bishop to c5, attacking the queen. And after e3, you can take. Actually, this is probably what should have happened. We get b takes e3 in the game. And here, Modi Love decided to take the knight instead. I probably would have played bishop c5 here, simply to provoke the pawn to go to e3. I think what Modi Love probably thought is he thought that with the, the pawn on e2, um, it was a little bit different versus the pawn being on e3. Again, it feels like this should be better due to the diagonal being closed just intuitively, but it's probably not all that big of a difference. So we get bishop takes a3, we get the trade of the bishops, and now we have queen to e3 check by Pechak. Probably a good reason why Modi Love should have forced the pawn to e3, because now black has to either go queen e7 here, or he's going to um, or he's gonna have to move the king and be unable to castle the king out of the center of the board. So we get king to d8 here. We get knight to f4 being played by Pechak, trying to bring the knight into the game. We get rook to e8, queen to d4, and now bishop to a6. Activated the bishop on this nice diagonal. Black also controls the only two open files here with both of his rooks on b8 and e8. So black is completely fine. We get queen takes a7 here, and now, now we have rook b6. Now, queen a7 is very bold too, as we like to say. There's the other classic phrase. It's a, you know, it's, gonna, it's a very bold, stra bold strategy, Cotton. And um, I think queen a7 is quite bold. Um, so we get queen to a7, we have rook to b6 here, and now white has to figure out what are you doing with your queen? Your queen is stranded wayward here on the queen side, the rook and the bishop guard each other, king guards the pawn, and there are a lot of problems because your knight also doesn't really have great jumping squares either with this knight on f6 dominating the two squares on d5 and h5 at the same time. So we get king to h1, Modi Love plays g5 here to attack the knight. We get knight to d5 here, which is basically a way of trying to trade down material. But once the material trade happens here with knight takes d5 and queen to a8 check, winning the knight on d5, black is actually going to end up being better here after bishop takes e2. Because when we get rook to e1, black can now play this move rook to e6, swinging the rook over to guard the bishop on e2. Also, if white were to play queen e5, which looks good on first glance, black can just go king to d8, rook is guarded, rook covers f6, and you will simply lose the rook on f1 on the next turn. So we get rook e1, rook e6 being played, queen to d2, and now Modi Love goes king to f8. So Modi Love also, he started out going king d8, king e7, king f8. He's moved his king three times, but now effectively the king on f8 is completely safe. Game continues with f4. We get g takes f4. Now the computer actually thinks that after g4, black has a bit of an advantage, but it looks very scary after f5, rook e3, and f6, because now there are all kinds of tricks of like lolly checkmates on g7 potentially. If you try to play queen takes c3 after takes takes an a4, now this a pawn rushes up the board. The pawn on f6 also can create some mating threats because the king doesn't have squares and it's just a little bit hard to judge whether this is good or not good so modi love decides to take instead we get queen f4 queen takes c3 and now we have rook e to c1 attacking the queen on c3 but also trying to win the pawn on c7 as well now here modi love plays queen to e5 which is a little bit disappointing because surprisingly enough after this move queen to d3 black is actually significantly better now Again, without knowing the evaluation, I think it's borderline impossible to play this because it just looks like after queen d3, their idea is like a4 and a5 to push the pawn. It looks like white could even go rook takes c7, although rook takes c7 actually loses to a very cool tactic, which is this move bishop to f3 here. If white takes with the bishop, there's rook to e1 check, trade, trade, king g2, and then queen f1 would be mate. And if white plays queen takes f3 after rook to e1, if you, if you trade the rooks, just to illustrate the point, takes... If you block with the bishop, I take and mate next turn. And if you block with the queen, I simply go takes, takes, and mate as well. So this would this would actually be a cool tactic, which is just close to winning. And if you don't take the bishop, I guess you can play h4, but after rook to e1, rook takes e1. There's also, I think, some kind of checkmate here with king to h2, and I think rook h1 mates. So if you take, there's queen to f1, which ends the game on the spot. And if you play bishop takes, I think there's, yeah, there's check. And if king h3, check and mate. And if you go to g1, it's the exact same thing with check and checkmate. 
So queen d3 would have been, been a better try, but again, king looks a bit a little bit loose. The pawn on h6 is loose. The f7 is weak. c7 is weak. a4, a5, a6 is playable. And so Modilev decides instead to play the move queen to e5. And after queen takes e5, rook takes e5. The game unfortunately ends in a very peaceful draw as well. Now, the way this game would have concluded uh, if, it had, if it had gone on would have been something like rook takes c7. Bishop to b5 here. White would have played something like, I don't know, h3. And we would have gotten like rook e1 takes takes actually probably not h3 here we probably would have gotten some like rook c c1 something like uh rookie six a4 and bishop c6 takes takes and a5 rook to a8 something like a6 c5 a7 rookie seven takes takes and with two pawns each on the king side it's just a very simple draw so this is probably what we would have gotten um if the game had continued on nonetheless it ends in a draw and with that um with that, we see that Jurgen Petschak is proving that it's possible to be extremely original by playing all sorts of openings under the sun, knight h3, h4, playing this a5 variation of the Spanish, and just playing chess. And I think it's worth noting that that is probably the one silver lining with, with the rise of technology is that even though so much of chess has become so memorized and everything's become so worked out in so many different variations, computers have shown us effectively that anything is playable as long as it's not an outright blunder. And to give you another example, there are openings like the Smith more a gambit which i played there are some things like the danish gambit which magnus carlson played in the grand chess tour and that is the one silver lining is that computers are basically proven that basically just play whatever you want it doesn't matter at all just play whatever you want if you don't actually blunder anything is fine literally anything because you can play knight h3 or h4 on move one and not lose so any, at any rate, uh, I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Uh, for me, it was a lot of fun to do this video because you don't oftentimes see strong top-level games featuring such openings, such meme openings, but I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure that subscribe button below if you haven't already, and I will be back soon with some more great YouTube content only. See you guys. Bye.